before the first car rolled onto the newly completed Kyalami Grand Prix circuit. Having lost the 1991 Class A championship to Opel, and more specifically Mike Briggs, BMW's Tony Viana set out to start the season well, and he did just that, beating Briggs into second place in both heats. Robbie Smith, having committed himself to the Inland Championship and the associated national races, had a bad start to the season when his JSN Motors BMW failed to complete the first heat. Peter Lance, who had made the same commitment to the inland races only, retired his BMW in much the same fashion. At Kalani, later in February, local lad John Craig showed the factory teams the way around during practice and secured pole position for heat one. As the race started, Craig kept his lead and Tony Viana found himself behind three very quick Opals. Mike Briggs managed to pass John Craig by outbreaking him into Stanick Bend. Craig lost his second place to Roddy Turner on the final lap, but Tony Viana had to be content with a fourth place and the three points that go with it. In heat two, as the car sped down into Conti Corner, both Roddy Turner and Grant McCleary became the first victims of what was to become a scrappy Class A race. As they hit for Conti Corner on the first turn. And this is a high-speed traffic jam as they go in. If anything had happened, and it does, Neil Brink goes into the side of Grand McCleary, spins them right round to 360. There's the traffic rushes past trying to avoid them all. Here it is from the outside. Briggs in the front. Then it's Viana. Roddy Turner on the outside getting pushed there by Dean Jabir. Goes into the side of him in the Winfield BMW. No brake light. He just keeps spinning him around. Neil Brink doesn't see the traffic jam. He goes into the side of McCleary and spins him around right in the middle of that back. Here it is again from the inside of Viana's car. Jabir closes right up on Viana's tail and goes into the side of Turner and starts to spin him around. Just keeps accelerating away, pushes him out of the way. And Leon Maria takes his chances as mechanical mayhem is left down there at Conti Corner. Well clear of the trouble, Mike Briggs soon pulled a healthy lead. Tony Viana, also unaffected in Conti, slipped into second place behind Briggs. This second place was soon threatened by Leon Maria, who for a few laps put Tony under immense pressure. While Viana successfully fought off Leon's attack, Dion Joubert inched his way up to an attacking position on the Alberanti Opel. Roger McCleary takes up on the action to the end of the race. As he goes into Castle Court, but Joubert has joined the fray, he goes on the inside, just shoulders him out of the way. He's done it to the second Opel, sends him pushed to the outside of Castle Corner, and Joubert now has got himself into third position. But Maria reckons that's where he wants to be. He sees blood, this former Mirage pilot, knows a thing or two about fighting as he closes on him. This is going to be desperate stuff before the end of this race. And here's the battle up front. This is for second position. Jabir closing on uh, Bion and gets pushed out of the way by Maria. He just came out of the sun at him, pushed him out of the way, and Maria says, my rightful place was in third position, and that's where I mean to be. Bion is in second. Maria is third, but in the front, it's Michael Briggs going for his second win of the day. And this is going to be the first time ever that Super Bosses have had two straight victories against the Winfield BMW. Here comes Briggs, here's Tony Viana, still full of fight, and Leon Marie in the Alberanti Delta Super Boss, a great third position after a big fight. If Tony was to battle at Kalani, worse was to come, as the Stanley Group N Championship moved to the tricky, tight Aldo Scribanti circuit near Port Elizabeth. In Heat 1, Mike Briggs shot into the lead on his hometown circuit. Leon Maret took second position after a brief tussle with Dion Joubert and managed to hold this place for the remainder of the race. Tony Viana started in the middle of the Class A pack and battled to better his position thereafter. He too was a carbon copy of the first race with Briggs ahead of Maret. Dion Joubert was taken care of by Roddy Turner, an incident which promoted Tony Viana to third place and allowed Grant McCleary to score a fourth. With two championship events won in a row, Mike Briggs was on a roll. BMW arrived at Kalani in April with two brand new Winfield 325 ISs. Kalani had favoured the Opel Superbosses and the fourth round of the championships were to be no exception. The new BMWs proved to be quicker than the old cars and the Opel camp were taken by surprise when the two BMs filled the front row of the grid. Tony Viana had developed a new car and was obviously putting the extra horsepower to good use. John Craig literally got rid of Dion Jabert in Stanick Bend, leaving a fight open for second place. Having secured the second place, Mike Briggs set about the task of demoting Tony Viana. 
the closing laps of this race had to be one of the hardest fought moments in Stanley Group N racing history. Victims this afternoon. And Mike Riggs takes victory as he closes in on the Winfield BMW. Lovely angle as we go in with Tony Viana, hard at work. He hasn't got your uh, riding shotgun for him, but he's got a very determined Michael Briggs just behind him. He wants a maiden victory for this motor car. And here we are in the final stage of this race. And Peter Laird giving Michael Briggs instructions as he goes for the inside of Volkswagen corner. Sweet revenge for the way that Viana handled him at an early encounter here at Kalani. And Briggs has got the advantage around the double right hand at Sabre. And also down the long straight as they go down to Static. It's AB8 breaking for the BMW's locked wheels. For the Opal as he goes in there, slides across the road. Viana's going to try and lift through the inside as he does there. But it's all happiness for Peter Laird and his team standing there. What Briggs is doing on the road with 200 metres to go is all he wants. As he comes to the line, just comma 0.5 of a second ahead of Tony Viana. Michael Briggs comes into the windfield pit to shake uh, Tony Viana's hand for a very clean race as we spoke to Michael Briggs. Things turned out my way and once I, I sort of sensed the blood, I went in for the kill. And uh, with Tony, you can always race like a gentleman. And uh, he made it difficult for me, but the gap was there and I took it. You're getting too old for this? Uh, not really, I think uh, it's, uh, I, I forgot how it feels like to be in front, you know. And I thought, well, what am I doing here, you know. But uh, eventually I saw the Opal coming up. I tried to play it because uh, the biggest thing is the tyres and brakes, so you have to look after it. And eventually I was charging more and more and I started running out of brakes and tyres and the handling, you know, got worse and worse. And that was it. Instead of, you don't go quicker, I went slower. And that's it. So hopefully next heat well, we better have a better plan. Heat 1 had set the mood for what the Class A pace was to be in Heat 2. There was just too much traffic and not enough road as the BMWs and Opals bumped and pushed their way into spaces that didn't really exist. Someone had to suffer the inevitable. Grant McCleary, with our in-car camera, became the victim to Hannes Oerstaisen. In this race, it was Tony Viana who had to do the chasing, while Mike Briggs had to shut down every possible chance that the cunning old fox behind him might decide to take. The new BMW machinery had worked, and nobody knew that better than Mike Briggs, who despite his wins at Kalani, arrived at Kyle Army in May, a very worried man. BMW took full advantage of the long Kyle Army circuit, Viana leading in Dion Gibert in a show of strength which for nearly three months took the sting out of Stanley Group N racing. The departure from Kyle Army had not been the end of Mike's problems. The Opals desperately needed to get back onto the tight coastal tracks where the BMWs battled to put their newfound power to full advantage. East London was not that type of track. At the moment the BM is definitely uh, the stronger of, of the two cars. It's 700 cc's bigger than us and, and uh, They've done a lot of work and they made the car work for them. Uh, their, their braking is also pretty good. Um, and it's, it's actually quite strange that two cars that are so different are, are so close in lap times. But at the moment, unfortunately, they've got uh, the slight edge on us. Tony started fast and never looked back. Behind the leading BMW, Mike Briggs and Dion Joubert fought briefly for second place. With that matter settled, the East London spectators had to look down the field for the Class A entertainment. This is McCleary. Trying to retain his fourth position or get it back from John Craig. He gets nudged by Craig, loses in the infield and really has to work hard in that motor car to recover from things. Craig gets back fourth position and McCleary's gone back to fifth. Here's another moment of action. We're in with Leon Marais. as he goes to the S as he gets a nudge from the back there. And who's it this time? It's Farouk Danga. Clarksdorf's businessman of the year is giving the business down here at East London as they fight for control over the bumps of the sweep as they come up to Beacon Bend on the last lap of this race. And it's Tony Viana and Dion Jabir, 1-2 for the Winfield BMW team. Michael Briggs comes through in third position. Then it's John Craig, Grant McCleary and Roddy Turner. Heat 1 seemed predictable, but the fighter in Mike Briggs was about to change all that. The results of the previous heat had just pushed Tony Viana into a two-point lead over Briggs on the championship table. As expected, Tony Viana used his pole position advantage to shoot his BMW into a commanding lead. For Briggs to win, he had to take the BMs on one at a time. Pushing his cadet to its absolute limit, Mike held the inside line into Coca Cabana and pushed Viana's barrier, Dion Joubert, back into third place. While Briggs set about Viana's bumper, the rest of the Class A cars were fighting for the lower order positions. Briggs 
spent the entire race working his way towards Tony's tail end. Inches lost down the long main straight were retrieved through the bins. Behind them, a war was being waged between Hannes Oosthuizen and Farouk Dango. The situation was quickly sorted out. With a flag out and waiting, Mike Briggs took the lead from Tony in a skillful piece of driving that had the crowd up and on their feet. But as the leaders rounded Beacon and headed for the line, Mike missed a gear, and Tony, as surprised as Mike, clinched the second heat. From the coast, the standing Group N Circus moved inland to the tight but highly entertaining Swatkorps Raceway. Just as Tony Viana had taken a lead in the championship, fate stepped in and robbed Tony of his best chance of a Class A championship victory since 1988. Illness kept Tony in bed all that day, and down on the start line, Dion Jabeur said it all. Uh, I feel a bit lonely without Tony to sort of support me, or for me to support him, um, but I'll do my best. What's the story there? Is the guy sick? <coughs> Tony's very ill. You know, if Tony doesn't come to a race meeting, you know, he's very ill. He's not a normal person, you know. Um, so he's, uh, hopefully by Kalama he'll be, he'll be healthy again. You don't think the attraction was to stay at home and watch the rugby test? <laughs> I don't think so, no. <laughs> As the lights turned green for the first heat, Dion sprang into the lead with Mike Briggs in close attendance behind him. Leon Moret had anxious moments as the bunch entered Conti Corner for the first time. With two wheels up in the air, Leon used an unsuspecting Peter Lance to bring him back down to earth. The race was hard fought in the middle field, with Dion leading from start to finish and Mike unable to do much about it. Back in third position. Uh, my form is really good. Um, it looks like uh, we just don't have the legs that the BMs have anymore. And uh, you know, I drove the best that I could and I'm sure Dion had something in reserve, so I really don't know what to expect. I think it'll just be luck that'll, that'll win, the, win Opal's way. It's going to be a while before we taste winning again. A somber and pessimistic outlook from the Opal driver as the cars start the second race of the day. Briggs not only found opposition from the Winfield BMW, but found Leon Maria giving him a hard time in the early stages. The SWAT Corps track proved to be even more tricky when the Class A cars caught the slower Class C traffic. Grant McCleary and Chris Clark arrived at the same spot at the same time, and the resulting spin put paid to McCleary's chance for points. With two laps remaining, Dion broke the gear lever on the BMW and was forced to pull off the track. Mike could hardly believe his eyes as he passed the stricken BM and drove on to claim nine points for his win. Tony was back in action for the one-heat race at Kailami, and to prove his point, went out and won the Class A race. Robbie Smith appeared at Kailami with renewed speed and scored a third place, pushing Briggs to a lowly fourth spot. This success convinced Smith to make the long trip to Cape Town for the 10th round of the championship. Opal's problem started when Roddy Turner's fuel pump ended his race before he finished the warm-up lap. Robbie Smith gave Tony Viana a run for his money at the front of the field, while Dion Joubert and Mike Briggs fought for third. The race finished in favour of Viana with Robbie Smith second and Mike Briggs third. In heat two, Robbie showed a clean set of heels. Or was it a clean pair of exhaust pipes to the factory cars? Tony Viana and Mike Briggs took up station in second and third places, respectively, while Dion Jaber, who had a bad start, worked his way up the field. Roddy Turner would rather have been at Clifton Beach. Dion Jaber had joined the Briggs Viana feud, which had distracted from Smith's efforts up front. We relived the closing moment of the race with the help of commentator Alan Johnson. But Briggs has an answer as they go through the twisty sections of the course. And time after time, there's a fight on his hands, almost door handle to door handle stuff as they storm down towards Continental Corner. Into Continental Corner, Tony Viana goes through. Briggs holds the inside line and keeps Joubert in third place. Briggs doesn't seem to have an answer for Viana as they go into the tight sections of the course. Viana using every trick in the book to make that track as narrow as possible for Briggs. Down the back straight towards Stanick Corner. Viana holding on to the brakes as they go into the bend. Forcing Briggs to slow down. Viana quicker out of the corners. 
And then, as they come out of Stanley Corner for the last time, the two cars touching. Nobody's giving way here. And as Robbie Smith comes across to win the heat, it's a big old for both Viana and Briggs behind. Viana out onto the grass and into a spin. Briggs managing to keep the car under control and getting back onto the tarmac. And Viana ending up facing the opposite direction. Let's take a look once again at that incredible incident at the end of the second heat of this Stanley Groupen event. Twenty-one days later, with the heat of the moment forgotten, the drivers gathered at Goldfields for the second last race of the season. Jeff Goddard had been called in to drive for Tony, who, since Kalani, had been hospitalized due to his illness. Every car carried a message wishing him well. Belcombe was never going to be easy for the Opals, the long back straight giving the BMWs a chance to stretch their legs. Robbie Smith had flashes of Hollywood as he outbraked everyone on the track by simply not using them at all. Mike Briggs suffered the effect of Robbie's newfound overtaking style, effectively allowing the two Winfield BMWs to take the honours unchallenged. Two hours later, Jeff Goddard, Roddy Turner and Farouk Dangor came together at the end of the back straight, leaving the midfield three cars short and spreading the race out. Dion Jabeur and Robbie Smith Having found the brake pedal, drove in tandem around the Goldfields track until the flag came out to give Dion another nine points. Mike Briggs would have dearly liked to have had Tony Viana racing at the final round at Kailami in October. Without Tony present, Mike would win the Class A championship without even competing, and that's not how Mike wanted it won. Tony did not make the line, and because of that, much of the Class A punch was missing from the front of the field. Credit must go to Dion and Robbie, who came home first and second in both heats, keeping the BMW flag flying for the man who had put so much time and dedication into the 325 IS, but could not be there himself. Mike Briggs was there and did what he had to do to complete the 1992 Stanley Group N season. In doing so, he carried away the Class A honours. Tony Viana, despite his absence, held on to second place, ahead of teammate Dion Jabeur.